All right, so this lecture is about active transport. So in contrast to passive transport, active transport requires energy. And that energy in a cell is always in the form of ATP. We will learn a lot more about ATP in the next two units, but remember I've told you that ATP is the energy currency of the cell. And if you think of glucose as like a $10 bill, ATP is like the singles, and in a cell, you have to pay for everything with single dollar bills. So you always have to convert the energy from food into ATP before you can do any work in a cell. So sometimes when active transport is happening in a cell, it's because you have to move particles, whether they're ions or molecules, what's called against a concentration gradient. Think of a gradient as a hill, and the concentration gradient, if you're going from high to low, would be downhill. And that's with the concentration gradient or down the concentration gradient. That doesn't require energy. But in this case, if you're going against the concentration gradient, you have to spend energy. So if you look at this diagram, you can see that there's five hydrogen atoms or ions on the outside of this cell and one inside. And you're still moving hydrogen from where there's less hydrogen ions to where there's more hydrogen ions. Some of you may notice that this is referred to as a proton pump. Remember that a hydrogen atom has one proton and typically one electron. If it loses its electron, it has a positive charge and what's really left is a proton. That's why it's referred to as a proton pump. And of course there may be some neutrons there as well, but nobody really cares about the neutrons in this particular context. So in this case, you might be moving something really small, but you're going against a concentration gradient from low to high concentration. Hydrogen atoms are one of the smallest things you could be transporting. Sometimes though, active transport isn't because of the concentration gradient, but it's because you're moving a really large molecule. And most often, those really large molecules, if you're talking about a cell, are going to be proteins. Proteins are made inside of a cell because DNA codes for the production of proteins and you have to have the sequence of nitrogen bases in the DNA um, for the cell to figure out what order to put the amino acids in. But once you've got the protein, it has to get outside the cell intact in exactly the right order. We've also been talking about starch. It doesn't really make sense to actively transport starch because starch is made of hundreds or thousands of glucose molecules stuck together. And every glucose molecule is exactly identical to every other glucose molecule, so if you have to put them in long chains, you can do dehydration synthesis in the next cell. So it's much easier to let glucose just, or to break them down by hydrolysis into glucose and let the glucose diffuse across a cell membrane and then reassemble starch in the next cell. But proteins you can't do that with because the amino acid sequence is very important and there are 20 different amino acids. All right, so um, when you are transporting a very large molecule or an entire organism into a cell, it's referred to as endocytosis. And if you're transporting something large out of a cell, it is referred to as exocytosis. So again, endocytosis is the process of taking material into the cell and involves the movement of the cell membrane. So the cell membrane has to pinch in, surround the particle, and then you have a vacuole with the particle in it. Oftentimes it's a food vacuole. So phagocytosis is when a cell ingests solid particles or entire single-celled organisms. So if you remember the flashcards we made, and you made flashcards with an amoeba on it, which had pseudopo uh, pseudopodia, which surrounded the food particle, um, the food that it might eat would be the um, paramecium or euglena, which were on your cilia and flagellum flashcards. So amoebas are actually um, fairly large single-celled organisms compared to all of the single-celled organisms they eat. Sometimes it might be bacterium, and sometimes it might be a euglena or a paramecium. In fact, you actually have uh, white blood cells called macrophages that gobble up bacteria and viruses in your bloodstream right now. Another type of endocytosis is pinocytosis, which is when liquids are transported across. And I think of pina coladas just as a way to remember which is which.
The last type of endocytosis we're going to refer to is referred to as receptor-mediated. So receptor-mediated um, is when particles are attached to receptors and then um, pulled into the cell. So there's usually a very specific shape of the receptor that matches the particle. In this diagram, you can see phagocytosis and pinocytosis side by side. So you have a large solid particle versus liquids with um, other particles dissolved in it. And here you can see the receptor mediated that you have this little purple triangle that fits into the red um, Y shape and it fits perfectly and it tells the cell to um, bring in whatever particle was received by the receptor. Now in the opposite, um, you have exocytosis. So cells may expel waste molecule um, by changing the shape of the cell membrane. And what I like about this diagram is it shows endocytosis, so the food taken in, this would be phagocytosis, and then a lysosome has fused with the food vacuole to digest it, and then some of the products of digestion stay in the cell, but some of them are expelled by waste. So this phospholipid bubble would merge with the cell membrane and then kind of pop open, releasing the waste. Um, sometimes exocytosis is getting rid of waste, but sometimes it's getting rid of um, proteins that need to do something outside the cell. So the difference between excretion and secretion, with excretion you're trying to get rid of something that's bad for the cell or that the cell doesn't need anymore. When you secrete something, it has a job to do somewhere else. So if this was going on in a beta cell in a pancreas, it might be secreting insulin into the bloodstream. So you're not getting rid of insulin as a waste product, but you're expelling insulin from the cell into the bloodstream so that it can go do a job somewhere else in the body. So again, um, try and answer these questions in your review packet. So pause this video and come back to it once you have filled this out. Again, just copying down the answers from the PowerPoint into your packet is not really going to be a good way to review. Which type of transport requires added energy? That would be active transport. In active transport, particles move from low to high concentration if they're small. Engulfing large amounts of material within the cell membrane is known as endocytosis because we didn't specify here whether it was solid or a liquid. But endocytosis of solid particles is referred to as phagocytosis and endocytosis of liquids is referred to as pinocytosis. And if we're going in the opposite direction, from inside the cell to outside of the cell, and we're getting rid of large particles, we are referring to exocytosis.